back to the scene of the crime. I was talking to Father Mo earlier. I want to begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we thank and praise you for the beginning of this new day, the beginning of this new week. Pray that you open our minds and hearts to receive all that you wish to give us during this time that we share with one another and with you. Pray that the Holy Spirit would come down upon us in power and abundance to open our minds, to open our hearts, to help us to grow in relationship with you. And on this feast of Our Lady of Lords, we ask the intercession of Mary, our mother, as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Bernadette, Pray for us, Our Lady of Lords. Pray for us, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So when Mark approached me about presenting today, and I began praying about the topic, being a teacher and a teacher of a faith in film class at Bishop Brady High School, uh, the first thing that came to mind was a movie. And the movie that came to mind was the 2013 film Lone Survivor. Has anyone seen Lone Survivor? The story takes place in Afghanistan in June 2005, and it centers around the character of Marcus Luttrell, played by Mark Wahlberg, and a four-man SEAL team which is set out to kill or capture the Taliban leader Ahmad Shah. The position of the team is compromised by three shepherds, and they do the humane thing, the ethical thing, and they release these guys knowing that they're probably going to inform on them to the Taliban and that they're going to have to run for their lives, and which is exactly what happens. The SEALs endure heroically. All of them are shot multiple times. They escape, they evade, constantly fighting back until three are killed and Marcus Luttrell is saved miraculously by a generous Afghani family. Um, kind of just ruined the movie for you, but I would say, I mean, it is called Lone Survivor, so you know somebody survives. <laughs> go, go watch it. It's a really, really good film. In the opening sequence of the movie, we hear the voice of Marcus Luttrell. There's a storm inside of us. I've heard many team guys speak of this, speaking of the SEAL teams. A burning, a river, a drive, an unrelenting desire to push yourself harder and further than anyone could think possible. Pushing ourselves into those cold, dark corners where the bad things live, where the bad things fight. We wanted that fight at the highest volume, a loud fight, the loudest, coldest, darkest, most unpleasant of unpleasant fights. The Navy SEALs are the best of the best. They're the toughest, smartest, strongest, best trained special forces operators in the whole world. They're able to go farther, shoot straighter, fight harder, endure longer than most of us can probably imagine. As I began reflecting on this, I asked myself the question, how did they get that way? And I came up with two things. First, they made a decision to never quit. They made a decision to be the best. They made a decision to be SEALs. They were determined to let nothing, 
Nothing stand in their way. They also had training. A lot of training. Not just to become Navy SEALs, but to stay razor sharp, to always be in peak physical condition, to continue tactical training, weapons training. SEALs are never content to be the best of the best. They're always trying to get better. I think that the saints have a lot in common with SEALs. In fact, I'd argue that the saints are the Navy SEALs of Christianity. They're the best of the best. The saints are God's spiritual special forces. And here's the thing. You and I are called to be saints. Not necessarily canonized saints, but saints nonetheless. A saint is quite simply someone who lives a life of heroic virtue in relationship with and in likeness to Jesus Christ. So it might seem like an odd comparison, but what can we learn from Navy SEALs about being saints? What do the saints have in common with Navy SEALs? I would suggest those same two things. The saints made a decision to never quit. The saints made a decision to be saints. It's a famous story of the sister of St. Thomas Aquinas coming to him one day and asking her saintly older brother, what do I have to do to become a saint? And his famous reply was, will it? If he lived today and he was familiar with Nike, he might have just said, just do it. The saints made a decision to be holy. They made a decision to cooperate with God's grace, to be free of sin and full of virtue. They were determined to let nothing, nothing stand in their way. And the saints also had training. They had a lot of training. Not just to be good people or even good Christians, but to be heroic in the practice of their faith. Not just to get to Mass on Sunday but to make the Holy Eucharist the center of their very lives. Not just to pray on occasion, but to take substantial time every single day to make prayer a priority in their lives. The saints fasted. The saints mortified their senses. The saints avoided anything which might injure their relationship with God. The saints were never content. The saints were always trying to get better. So if we're going to fight like men, like Catholic men, like saints, we need to make a decision, a determined, ironclad, irrevocable decision to be saints, to let nothing stand in our way. We need to do everything in our power to be holy, to cooperate with God's grace, to grow day by day in holiness. That has to be our number one priority. Nothing can stand in the way of that goal. Nothing can take precedence over that decision or that training. Without that resolve, that determination, that irrevocable decision, no one becomes a Navy SEAL. And without that resolve, that determination, no one becomes a saint. If we sort of want to be saints... It's simply not going to happen. It's not enough for us to just be good people. We have to be determined to be saints. We need to let nothing get in the way of that goal. No habit, no sin, no goal, no Netflix series, no video game, no project at work, no sporting event, no relationship. No pleasure, no pastime, nothing. If we're going to fight like Catholic men, once we've made up our minds to be saints, we need training. Now, obviously, the training of a saint is going to look a little bit different than the training of a Navy SEAL. In order to be saints, we need to train like saints. And I think a great model for the spiritual special forces that we aspire to join is the soldier saint Ignatius of Loyola. Saint Ignatius 
was born in 16th century Spain. He was a good soldier, but vanity, pride, worldly ambition, and even sin had distracted him from the most important thing in life, to be a saint. In a battle outside Pamplona, he was grievously injured in the leg. The injury threatened not only his military career, but also his good looks. It wounded his vanity. As he lay there in his sickbed, the only books he could find to distract him were the Gospels and the lives of the saints. They proved to be the catalysts of his conversion. He asked himself a question as he lay there that would change his life and would, by extension, change the world as he would one day go on to found the Jesuits, which brought the gospel to millions of people all over the planet. And as he lay there reading the lives of the saints, the question that he asked himself was this. What if I were to do what St. Francis and St. Dominic did? What if I were to put Jesus Christ at the center of my heart and my life? What if I were to pray like the saints, do penance like the saints, live and work like the saints? And you know what? That's just what he did. And you know what happened? He became a saint. And you know what else? If we do what the saints did, we can become saints. So how do the saints train? What are the weapons that they fight with? I'm going to suggest seven secrets of saintly seal training. Seven weapons with which we engage in spiritual warfare. I would say that all of these things need to be a part of our lives if we're going to fight like Catholic men, like saints. First is humility. We need to always remember that we do not make ourselves holy. God makes us holy. Our effort to grow in the spiritual life is necessary, but that effort is insufficient. We need God's grace. Everything is grace, as St. Paul says. This is where humility comes in. We must never fall into the error of believing that it's our spiritual program, our devotion, that's going to transform us into saints. Relying on God in all things and at all times is the foundation of the spiritual life, the foundation of our training as spiritual seals. Second, we need the Eucharist. In the temporal order, we need food to survive. Even Navy SEALs have to eat and stay hydrated in order to function. We cannot be saints without proper spiritual nourishment. This is why the lives of the saints were centered on the Eucharist. The body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ whom we receive in the Holy Eucharist is the food and drink which makes us grow in holiness. So we need to make the Mass the cornerstone of our lives. And remember, Sunday Mass is the minimum. Seals and saints are not about doing the minimum. They're about going above and beyond. So what are we willing to do? What are we willing to adjust in our schedules? What are we willing to sacrifice in order to get to daily Mass once or twice a week? The Mass, and I would add Eucharistic adoration, have to be at the center of our lives if we're going to be saints. Third is confession. We need to know that no matter how firm our resolve, we're going to fall. We're going to falter and fail. We should never give in to discouragement. Discouragement is not of God. We have a God who loves us. We have a God who is merciful. We have a God who longs to pick us up and to heal us when we fail. In the final line of the movie Lone Survivor, we hear Marcus Luttrell say, no matter how much it hurts, how dark it gets, or how hard you fall, you are never out of the fight. We are never out of the fight. 
the seals in Lone Survivor really take a beating. It's really hard to watch. They're all shot some multiple times. There are a couple different points in the film where they're pushed back to the edge of a cliff by an overwhelming force, and they just jump off a cliff. And they get up, and they keep going. It's, it's unbelievable. Their resilience is unfathomable. They just keep getting up and looking each other in the eye and saying, still in the fight, still in the fight. This is why the sacrament of confession is so important. It's a critical part of our training to be saints. Confession is a sacrament of healing designed to get us back on our feet and back in the fight, back on the way to holiness and sanctity. Regular sacramental confession should be a regular part of our training, at least, I would say, once a month. I heard John Paul II went to confession daily. I asked myself, goodness gracious, what what could he possibly confess every day? But you know, he was a saint. Saints are acutely aware of their faults and long to be embraced by the mercy of God in that, in that sacrament, the sacrament of confession. Fourth is prayer. So the necessity of prayer in spiritual combat is kind of a no-brainer. But I'm going to suggest a specific kind of prayer needs to be a part of our program, and that is meditation. St. Teresa of Avila once wrote that meditation is the basis for acquiring all the virtues And to undertake it is a matter of life and death for all Christians. Life and death for all Christians. A quote like that from a saint and a doctor of the church should really get our attention. Meditation is a matter of life and death for Christians. But if that's not enough, how about another quote by another saint and doctor of the church, Alphonsus Liguori. It's impossible for him who perseveres in meditation to continue in sin. He will either give up meditation or renounce sin. Meditation and sin cannot exist together. Taken together, those are two pretty powerful arguments for us to be meditating every single day. We literally can't be saints without it. Now, if you feel like you could use a little help in getting going in meditation, or maybe need a refresher, or maybe even just getting going in the spiritual life, I have three suggestions. The first is a series on formed.org called Lexio Prayer. It's presented by Dr. Tim Gray at the Augustine Institute. It's an excellent, pretty short series. I think it's six episodes, maybe about 30 minutes each. It's a really great, basic, user-friendly introduction to Lexio Divina, praying with Scripture, meditating with Scripture. Second is my favorite book all time on prayer, a book called Time for God by Father Jacques Philippe. Anything by Jacques Philippe is, in my opinion, awesome. I have most of his books. Most of them are really short. They're barely 100 pages, very accessible, very easy read. And then finally, the book that jump-started my interest in the spiritual life and I would say kind of my second conversion was a book called The Fulfillment of All Desire by Ralph Martin. Can't speak highly enough of this book. It's, it's a little intimidating to look at. It's like 500 pages. It's, it looks like a big commitment. But he writes in a very accessible uh, style and he essentially takes the whole of the spiritual life and condenses it into this, this one book, um, looking at all different perspectives from many different saints throughout the ages um, and showing how they're all in sync in terms of, of the spiritual life and spiritual growth. They might use slightly different language, but they're all talking about the same thing. Fantastic book. And I would be remiss, especially on this, the, um, the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, if I didn't mention the rosary as another uh, weapon in prayer that we should all be uh, employing. I think it was St. John Vianney who said uh, that the rosary is the scourge of the devil. If we're not going to be uh, availing ourselves of that in trying to grow in holiness, um, we're going to be lacking some real spiritual power. 
And speaking of the scourge of the devil, we need to be working to overcome sin in our lives. And this goes with number six, which is practicing virtue. It should go without saying that we have to eradicate mortal sin from our lives if we're going to be saints. We need to view sin as a disease which infects our lives and kills our spiritual growth, because that's exactly what it is and exactly what it does. And when mortal sin is no longer habitually a part of our lives, we need to set to work on venial sin. Many saints suggested that the best way to overcome sin in our lives is to really focus on practicing the virtue that most opposes that sin, whatever we're struggling with. So you could say if, we're, uh, if we find that we're selfish, we should really try to be generous. If we sin a lot with our tongues, we should really strive to be silent, to mortify our tongues, and so on. And another thing that can really help us to overcome sin and practice virtue and a time-tested practice of the saints is fasting, self-denial. Fasting is not something that we can only do during Lent. Again, it's one of the time-tested methods of Christian spirituality of saying no to ourselves, to our appetites, to our inordinate attachments, so as to say yes more and more to Almighty God in our lives. And there are many ways to fast. It doesn't just have to be food. Of course, it could be food, but it doesn't have to be. We could fast from video games. We could fast from sports, watching sports on TV, from TV or Netflix, Facebook or Instagram, or from social media in general. The thing that we fast from should be something that's dear to us, something that maybe distracts us from God. It should also be something that costs us, Whenever I have my, uh, my uh, annual Lenten conversation with my students at Bishop Brady, I always use the example of, of soda. Um, and I say, what if I was to tell you I was going to give up soda for Lent? And most of them are like, wow, that's pretty intense. And then I say, well, what if I was to tell you then that I, I drink probably about four sodas a year? And they're like, well, that wouldn't be that intense. <laughs> I'm like, well, no. So... We need to give up something that's going to cost us something. Something that might cost one person something might not cost me anything. Uh, So what's going to cost us? What's dear to us? What's what's the thing that distracts us from God? It should make us feel uncomfortable. We should pray our fasting. We feel the hunger or the lack of the thing that we're giving up. We should pray that moment, that lack, and ask ourselves to be filled more and more with Almighty God. We should... Um, make sure that our fasting is motivated by, by love and carried out with charity and humility. So in conclusion, life is a battle. If we're going to be the saints that God has created us to be, we need to be ready for the fight and we need to be properly equipped for combat. Remember that quote from Marcus Luttrell I mentioned earlier I think it could equally apply to men who want to be saints. There's a storm inside of us, a burning, a river, a drive, an unrelenting desire to push yourself harder and further than anyone could think possible. I think I think St. Ignatius and all the saints felt that. If we're going to be the men of faith who live and thrive in the world today, a world which is so hostile to the faith and to the faithful, we need to be determined to be saints, to train like saints, to fight like saints. That means making holiness our number one priority. That means taking a cold, hard look at our priorities and our schedules and making the tough but critical changes we need to make in order to make Jesus Christ and these seven weapons the center of our lives. Rest assured, that will not be easy. But being a saint never is. Being a saint means fighting sin and building virtue by the grace of God alone, by the power of the sacraments and prayer. It means, as Marcus Luttrell continued, pushing ourselves into those cold, dark corners where the bad things live, where the bad things fight. We have to be ready for that fight. We have to be determined 
to persevere, to never quit, to get up one more time than we fall by the strength which comes from God, no matter how hard, how ugly the battle gets, to say with seals and saints alike, still in the fight. On the cusp of his conversion, St. Ignatius asked himself the question, what if I were to do what St. Francis and St. Dominic did? And we know what happened. Let's ask ourselves that same question. What if I were to do what the saints did? Well, gentlemen, let's find out. Amen. We got a little bit of time left? Yeah. I was just going to, uh, one of the things that I wanted to, to mention, um, but um, I didn't want it to be too long, was, um, has anyone ever heard of the 40% rule? There's, uh, now, this is a book that I wouldn't necessarily recommend. <laughs> Um, it's called Living with a Seal. It's by a guy named Je- uh, Jesse Eisler. He was the, uh, I think he might still be the owner of the Atlanta Hawks. So he's obviously a pretty wealthy dude. And he's also um, an ultramarathon runner. And he tells a story of being in an ultramarathon. And this was an unsupported, any marathon runners? <laughs> Mark. <laughs> 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 so this was an unsupported marathon. So the only uh, stuff that you had was, was the things that you brought with you. And uh, Jesse Eitzler, being a man of means, uh, you know, he had doctors and he had tents and he had, you know, all kinds of, you know, hydration and food. And uh, he was doing it with a number of other people. So he was running one leg of this 120-mile race. And as he was setting up, he noticed this guy sitting off by himself. And he was running, as he came to find out, this whole ultra by himself. So all 120 miles by himself. And the only thing he had was a lawn chair, a package of crackers, and a bottle of water. And so he was like, this guy's crazy. Who is this guy? So well, so he, uh, they finished the race. And... Jesse hung around to see, like, I got to see, does this guy make it? And the guy came limping across the finish line before the deadline. And he had broken all the small bones in his feet. And he was um, just about in kidney failure. But he finished. And it turns out that this guy was David Goggins. I don't know if you ever heard of David Goggins. He's, like, one of the toughest men alive. He was a Navy SEAL. He, was, he went through, uh, like, two or three other special forces training. He's, uh, he's big into, obviously, physical fitness. So Jesse Eitzler calls this guy up and says, i got to train with this guy. Now, I don't know about you, but that would be the last guy on the planet I would want to train with. Um, so he calls him up. He flies him over to his house, and he, he's like, I'll do this, but we have one rule. You have to do anything that I say. Anything and everything I say, you do. So um, he's like, okay. And again, I don't know who's crazier. So the story goes... And this is the one worthwhile thing I thought was in the book. The story goes that um, they went down to the gym in his, like, you know, swanky New York apartment, you know, complex, whatever. And um, he says, all right, I want you to jump up on the pull-up bar and do as many pull-ups as you can. So he jumps up and he gets, like, eight, struggling, you know, the last couple. And he says, okay, wait. And so he waits, like, 30 seconds. He says, all right, I want you to do as many pull-ups as you can. So he jumps back up on the bar, and he does, like, three. He says, okay, I want you to wait 30 seconds. You can do as many as you can. So he, he, like, barely gets one. And then David Goggins looks Jesse Eitzler in the eye, and he says, we're not leaving here until you do 100. (laughs) And he's like, I'm done. Like, my arms are shaking. Like, I can't do it. So... They, they ended up staying there until he did 100. It was like three hours or something, but he did 100. And then he looked at him and he told him about the 40% rule. And this is evidently something that, that they learn in the special forces, that when your body is like done and you can't go any further, you're at about 40% of what your body's capable of doing. 
And what the special forces do is they're able to break through that 40% barrier to go, again, thinking about that scene that I mentioned in Lone Survivor. I mean, I can't fathom, like, all these people are there shooting at them. They say, well, there's a cliff. We just, we'll just jump. We'll just jump off the cliff. And they, they jump. They tumble down. They get, their, they get their weapons, and they just they keep fighting. Like, that's just like breaking through that 40% barrier. And when I, I read the book, because um, I was intrigued by that principle, and I think that that 40% rule applies to the spiritual life as well. How far are we willing to push ourselves to grow in holiness? Now, obviously, we need to be prudent with, with penance, and we have responsibilities as, as men with families and so forth. But what are we willing to do? What are we willing to sacrifice? What are we willing to, um, to make happen in our lives, to make mass a priority? How, are we, how early are we willing to get up to pray, to meditate? What are we willing to give up in our lives that distracts us from God? And we're going to come up against that 40% barrier pretty quick, I think. And the challenge is to stay close to the Lord, to grow in relationship with him through the sacraments, through prayer, through groups like this where we can you know, share our trials and tribulations with one another and have the support. You know, Iron sharpens iron, as they say. And really break through that barrier and be the sense, saints that only we can be. So I thought I would share that last story since we had five minutes. So thank you for having me here with you guys. It's great to be back. Oh, Lord.